Welcome to Whole and Unleashed, a podcast about coming home to ourselves, featuring conversations with special guests on topics related, but not limited to burnout, mindset, fulfillment, transitions, wellness, and so much more. I am your host, Jessica Locke, Astrala Yoga Guide and Holistic Wellness Coach, and this podcast is not about telling you what to do. I believe we all have the answers we need within. This podcast is here to inspire you, help you find clarity, and maybe give you an extra nudge towards living wholeheartedly. And of course, we'll be sharing tools and strategies from our guests to embrace your inner wisdom and live unleashed. Ready to dive in? You know how sometimes you get this inner voice, this nudge from within? And while it might not be logical, you can feel it in your bones that it's trying to lead you somewhere. In today's episode, Nadine shares the magic of becoming still, listening to her higher self and allowing her path to unravel. I was introduced to Nadine through a mutual friend of ours, Carla, and we hit it off right away. We could have talked for hours. Nadine is an intuitive energy healer and coach. Even though she started her spiritual journey and worldwide holistic therapies training over 25 years ago, She fell off her path for about a decade and became spiritually disconnected, mentally overwhelmed, and physically exhausted. It took closing her business, losing her marriage, and selling her home, all within three months, to learn the value of embracing stillness in her mind and body, to begin listening to her inner wisdom, and eventually reconnecting and finding her way back to herself. Now, she helps anxious and sleep-deprived, high-functioning women deeply restore and connect to themselves, reclaiming their inner peace and rebuilding energy. In today's episode, Nadine shares what she thought her initial path was and what took her out of it, how she followed her curiosity, leading her to learn about Ayurveda and holistic therapies, on why she launched a custom dress business that championed body acceptance how she got swept up in the busyness of doing and got disconnected from herself. She talks a bit more about the devastating three months that served as a catalyst into her stillness, the resistance of being in flow state at first, and how she learned to embrace that ultimately, some of her adventures in following her inner voice, and so much more. Come join our grounding conversation. Thank you so much for joining me today. Oh my gosh, it's my pleasure. Of course. I am so excited. We briefly chatted a couple of weeks ago and I felt so excited for our conversation. I can continue to dive in a little bit more. Absolutely. So Nadine, tell me a little bit about yourself. Where are you from? (laughs) Um, So originally, um, I live in Toronto now, but originally I'm from Stony Creek and Stony Creek is just east of Hamilton. I think it's part of the greater Hamilton area now, but um, when I was growing up there, it was actually the village of Stony Creek. So it was much smaller. Um, I grew up between the escarpment and the base, so it was called the plateau, and mm-hmm. there were a lot of orchards, and it was really quite, um, really quite special, like being able to play outdoors. I felt like I had a really intimate connection with nature because I spent so much time outside and it wasn't this big developed area. Yeah. What were some of your favorite memories? Um, well, definitely playing outside. Um, I would say an, an interesting memory. I was the only girl on the street for probably about 10 years, maybe just over, but I think around 10 years. So, um, you know, I played a lot of Star Wars and we would go and throw um, old crab apples that had fallen off the trees. And I remember playing uh, football with the boys and I had, you know, Lee press on nails yeah. <laughs> that we kept popping off. Like I was such a girl and it was it, like, it, like I enjoyed all of those things. And it was just this funny, um, really endearing experience though, growing up. And Then I think the summers, like summers are something that I hold so dear. We had a cottage and my dad was a teacher and we would just spend the day after school ended until Labor Day up north. And I'd, you know, play in the ponds and catch frogs and swim and be on the beach. And 
yeah, so much, like a lot of time in nature. Yeah, I went to the cottage for the first time ever um, last year. It was my first cottage experience because I moved here 10, almost 13 years ago, and I never understood it because what is cottage? People talk about it all the time, and once (laughs) I was there, I'm like, this is amazing. You just drive an hour or two from away from the city and then you get to kind of disconnect from everything. Yeah, it, um, it is. It's really incredible that just in that short time period. And I always feel like, you know, once I was older and we would just go on weekends here and there, um, you know, in that time, I felt like weekends felt like a week just because you had, you know, it was just this decompression. And of course, being in nature again, it's just so soothing and it feels like time slows down. Yeah, yeah, I, I miss it. I need to find, a, I'll find myself closer to nature one day. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I know. <laughs> yeah. Tell me a little bit about, I guess, the beginning of your career path maybe like closer to when you were deciding what you wanted to do as a career I guess for sure um so I think I had shared with you a little briefly before my I was originally wanted to be a doctor and like so much so that I went to a high school where none of my friends were going because it was like really strong academia and I took Latin for three years which is wow. <laughs> yeah it was like I was like this is what I'm gonna do and um in my first year looking back at it now i can understand why but it was like everything the universe was just putting everything in front of me to say this is not your path you know my father had an episode uh like with his heart he collapsed my grandmother who was like my most special person passed away um i you know during exams at the end i got mono (laughs) and was sick and i had a couple other things bubble up in there and it's just like, wow, that was quite a year. And looking back, you know, absolutely all of these things saying this is not your path. And so um, funny enough, I needed a summer job and I saw an interview for an esthetician's assistant and thinking, well, that sounds kind of something medical. Maybe I'll look into that, having no idea. And um, I end up at this Aveda concept spa and I'm flipping through an Aveda magazine while I'm waiting for my interview. I'm like, what is this all about? Um, and so I was introduced to the world of Ayurveda and, and holistic spa therapies and all of that. And I ended up getting the job, training on the job. And um, eventually, um, you know, I actually owned a spa in between and then I ended up working for Aveda Canada and Chavello, and I was a national trainer and just loved what I was doing. And that actually ended up pouring into management of training and development for Aveda Canada. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, it's just such an interesting shift, you know, and, and seeing like how things will just come to you and, and um, when you realize what it's there for and following Mm -hmm. um kind of the path that's being laid out for you but uh yeah I I that was my career and then I had twins after I got married and you know after the fog lifted which was probably by the time they were about two you know Mm -hmm. I'd say the first three to six months I can't quite remember a whole lot um at once but After that time, I decided I wanted to do something and become an entrepreneur and um, and have something that I would have for myself once the kids were starting into school, but that still would provide flexibility. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so I I opened a styling business, which then poured into a dress business. And uh, I want to hear a little bit more about your dress business, Uh, how the idea came to be. Well. So, you know, working as a stylist, um, my clients, I would overhaul wardrobes and do shopping. And, um, you know, it's a pretty intimate process when you're working with people and their wardrobes. And quite often I would find um, my clients, I would bring things for them to try or they would be trying to, you know, try and close that they had purchased and they wouldn't fit. And honestly, just watching that whole experience and not only the disappointment and the knock to their self-esteem, but really 
the lack of body acceptance. And, um, and I felt like it was just such a detrimental process and wanting to, you know, shout from the rooftops, there's nothing wrong with you. It's the clothes. Like, you know, just because a, some piece of clothing doesn't fit your body, there's nothing wrong with your body. And um, anyhow, so having experience in that, I then, um, along with a good friend of mine, we decided to open a custom dress business. And originally we thought we would do all types of clothing, but then I'm a huge fan of a dress. I would live in dresses. So we decided, <laughs> um, like seriously, I would garden in dresses. <laughs> really, even in the winter here in Canada? I, you know what, in the winter, I'm less often found in a dress, but but um, you know, just something casual and yeah, I love I love love dresses. Yeah. Um, so we decided that we were going to start a, a dress business, a custom dress business, and really being able to uh, champion body acceptance, body and you know embracing your body, and creating clothes to fit the person instead of the person trying to fit the clothes. And um, so we took off to Vietnam because Hoi An is the capital of custom tailors for the world, the largest per capita. And um, of course, my uh, then husband, at, you know, at the time was like, of course, you're starting a business and you have to go to Vietnam. <laughs> um, I'm like, oh, it's the first step. So we went, we found our tailors. Um, we really wanted to have someone who was on our team even though they're on the other side of the world, but share in similar values, um, different ways that they would give back to their community, um, you know, eco-conscious, all of those things. So there were a number of things that needed to line up for us as well as quality. And, um, and so we found that and we ran this business for about six years. And for the first good couple of years, we worked um, doing trunk shows, uh, everything was in person because we were also doing market research to be able to understand and get the feedback and, and know how, um, you know, and make change along the way. Mm -hmm. And then we decided to take it online because we really wanted to reach a global market. And I found myself sitting in front of a desk and in front of a computer. And I just remember saying to my business partner in front at the time, like, I'm dying a slow death. This, this is draining me of all my joy and, um, and I just, I can't continue anymore. And what part of it was draining? Well, I, re I recognize in myself that I'm a person who um, feeds off of other people's energy and connection um, and being able to, being able to, I don't know. I mean, I think just being around people. I just, I love being around people. I am, you know, I'm, I guess I could say I'm like an extroverted introvert. Like I need my time away and yeah. um, I need to have solace, but, but I love being around people and just working on, on a computer and um, my business partner, uh, partner at the time, she lived in Niagara Falls. And so, and I was in Toronto, and so we would only get together once a week for, you know, she'd be overnight. So it wasn't like we had, um, you know, a robust situation where we're working together all the time. And so I felt, I really felt lonely. And, yeah. um, and then it started, then I started kind of tapping into, there's more, like there has to be more that I'm here, like my purpose has yeah. to be bigger um, than what I'm doing right now or different in some way. Yeah. And how old were your twins by the time? Wow. So my twins were nine. They were nine. Time. Yeah. Yeah. It, uh, it was quite a, quite a change. Um, we ran the business and then I think I shared with you, it was all within a matter of three months, I decided to close the business. Um, my marriage ended and then we sold our home and everything changed um, for us as a family and career and, you know, just everything. Yeah. 
yeah how did you feel in that time knowing that you had to make that decision but also knowing the consequences that might come up with it it was an incredibly difficult decision um but uh it's interesting because uh when you know something is aligned and you know that you're you know you're you're moving on a path and you're moving in a way that you should be in the back of your mind and in your soul you're feeling like no this is right like it's really really hard yeah. <laughs> and um your logical brain runs through the different scenarios over and over and over right like what are you thinking and what are you, like what are you doing but it's when it's in when you can feel it in your body that it's right then you know that you're making the right choice does that make sense yeah, totally. Thank you for sharing that part because a lot of times our mind overrides what our body feels, what our yearnings are, because we can always logic ourselves to stay in a place, even though it seems good in the outside, but not good for you. Absolutely. Yeah. And really being true, like being true to yourself. Yeah. And having the courage to listen and trust that voice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's not, it's not always easy. Um, but like I said, if you know it's right, then yeah, a little bit of a salve <laughs> for the soul. Yeah, and where did that lead you afterwards? Well, it left me in um, a new a new home with my kids. Um, you know, a new situation where um, I had my kids with me fifty percent of the time, which you know was a huge thing when you're when you're um, you know, your mom and, and you've been living a certain type of lifestyle and, and caring for the kids. And, um, so it really felt like everything, like almost like the rug was pulled out from under, like, who am I now? And it's interesting, like the way that I described it, um, you know, things started to change at the end of May in that year. And, you know, at first I was like, okay, now I'm a person who's going to explore a new career path. And then, uh, then it was like, now I'm a person who is leaving, like we're leaving a marriage. And now I'm a person who's preparing a home for sale, you know, all very, very quickly. Now I'm a person looking for another house. And then now I'm a person settling my kids into a home. And then all of a sudden I was like, who am I? Like, what, what am I doing now? Where, like, what's my purpose? And it was really, I was at a point where it was completely um, open to self-exploration. And at that point, um, I think it was such a catalyst for me to really become quiet and listen, not only because I needed to heal and I knew that I needed to process emotion and be quiet and take time away so that I could move through the, all of those things. Um, but it also strengthened my connection to my, you know, my higher self and my soul and being able to hear messages that were coming through. And um, I think I shared, I decided I wanted to do my yoga teacher training, which is something I thought I would do, oh gosh, you know, many years before, before I got married. Yeah. And I thought that, you know, that I think might be a great opportunity for some healing to move mm -hmm. through that and to deepen my practice and, um, and really reconnect in that way. And I had no plan to teach. It was kind of like, this is what I'm going to do for and yourself. <laughs> myself. And I'm like, wow, is that the cliche thing? Like people get divorced and then they do yoga teacher. <laughs> you know, Cause I've heard of a lot of people, which is amazing. Like if you're doing it. Um, and you know, I thought here it is for, for me, I'm going to give this gift to myself. And um, it just, things started clicking and I finished my teacher training on a Tuesday and I started teaching on a Thursday. Like, <laughs> you gave yourself two days in between. <laughs> yeah, well I had to give myself a day because I needed to get insurance. So I had to actually <sighs> graduate. The next day I had to get insurance so that I could teach the following day. And um, yeah, like everything just flowed. And, you know, when things start lining up and really falling into place, that's when you know that you're moving in the right direction. And 
you know, yoga also brought me back to my breath in a really um, clear and strong way, which is kind of my pathway into connecting. Mm -hmm. And I started, I found that I started moving through my day in a, in flow. Mm -hmm. um, I would allow space for no expectation. And can you explain yes. a little bit more how does inflow feel? I think it's, it's something hard to explain. I'm just curious what your take could be. Absolutely, yeah. Um, and this is what it means for me. I, you know, I'm sure that others can um, experience it in a different way. But for me, um, it's like I literally will walk around and just like, okay, what? oh, I feel like making the tea. And then as I'm making the tea, I'm like, oh, this, you know, things will just come up and, you know, not having something set out. Now, don't get me wrong. I have days with my to-do list and I, I have to be productive. Like I don't live <laughs> yeah. that, that way all of the time. Um, but when I know that I need to either figure something out or I feel like things are mounting and I might feel a little bit of overwhelm around, like, how am I going to do all of these things? What do I need to do? that's when I'll go into that kind of zone and just try to let, you know, create a lot of space, let things go and then just see where the day takes me and what, what thoughts bubble up to the surface, what things present and say like, Oh, maybe go and do this now. And, and then that will lead me to another place. Mm -hmm. that when sense? you, yeah, that makes sense. When you started doing that, how did you, I imagine there was a little bit of resistance. I actually felt really unproductive. Um, and I thought it was a form of procrastination. Right. That's what society yeah. tells us, right? Absolutely. Um, yeah, like it's a very clear message from society. So yeah. it felt very counterintuitive at the beginning. And I think the, the thing that probably helped me recognize that it wasn't procrastination was when things again would start to fall into place or, be, or all of a sudden the momentum around something would build and I'd be like, oh, that was so easy. Like that task that I felt was going to take a long time or I wasn't sure where I would fit it in. All of a sudden it just flowed out of me and I finished it and it was done. You know, so, um, but it's, but I think the key to, to that is really being aware of what are the potential results here. And they're not always tangible. It may not be like, I ticked four things off my to-do list today. It might be, oh, I feel better about, um, you know, a certain situation or I allowed space for some healing today, which then made me more productive the next day or, or whatever. Yeah. Being very mindful of how you feel about those tasks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, yeah, I think, I think that it's, you know, just a matter of giving yourself permission to take that time and create that space. Absolutely. I, coming from, I was in an advertising background and it was, everything was due yesterday. So I was so used to the rush and getting things done, checking things off my list that when I quit my job, I had all the time in the world. I was, I know I needed rest, but I, I was also overwhelmed with what is the next step. So it's interesting to hear you share a little bit of, you know, really taking the space to figure it out, even yeah. if it wasn't clear and listening to that voice. And I think, so many of us sometimes don't listen to that voice because mm -hmm. our logic is, you know, so much more louder than our intuition if it's if you don't practice that tuning in. Absolutely. Well, as, as you say that, what pops into my mind is like less doing, more being. Like just <sighs> yes. allow yourself to be and see what that brings up. See yeah, that's what I'm testing this month. I'm telling <laughs> myself every time I want to do something or like I feel like I'm on overdrive, I'm like, just be, just be. <laughs> right. <laughs> I know. And it's not easy. And, and also celebrating um, when you do allow yourself that space and, 
you know, like I had mentioned, recognizing the potential results, but like even, even if you can't find a potential result, celebrate that you let yourself have that space. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so after your yoga training, uh, what else, where else did it take you? Um, so I finished my the yoga teacher training and then I really felt called to get back into um, my Reiki studies. So I had started right. back like in the nineties and just things lined up again with that. Someone, someone in my yoga teacher training had shared of this woman who was, um, you know, she was, had some training coming up and this once a year and anyhow, she's now a mentor for me with my Reiki. Um, and just one thing led to the other. And, you know, I, I, I did more of my studies and then I decided, you know what, I'm just going to get my practicum done because I'm going to make this a business. And, yeah. and, um, oh, wow. It was, I, I had like, I just decided like, I'm going to do this and you have to do, I think it was 24 case studies mm -hmm. and I just decided I'm going to just get them all done this summer because I'm going to launch my business this fall, like yeah. really, you know, create a, a more of a business around it. And they, everything, you know, people that I reached out to, everybody was able to fit it in and juggling schedules with kids in the summer and being able to, uh, I, I set up a treatment room in my home and all of that came together really easily and quickly. Um, and then I remember at the end of the summer thinking, I'm going to go in, I had a yoga class I was going to, I'm like, I'm going to go and in Shavasana, I'm going to figure out the name of my business because I knew that I wanted to register my business that day. And mm -hmm. I thought, and I remember talking to my mom on the phone on the way. I'm like, you know what? I'm going to figure out my, my name today while I'm in, in Shrasner. And it just came to me, like the, the name of my business is becoming still. And um, I was like, okay, that's it. And I came home, I registered my business. I think the next day I got in the car and drove up to visit my mom and she lives up North. And as I was up there, there's, um, I love crystals. So I do, I incorporate crystal therapy into what I, my treatments as well. Mm -hmm. And I realized I want to have uh, little tumbles to sell like little crystal tumbles because, um, I always give homework to my clients. <laughs> so, <laughs> like in between, this is what we're going to be working on. And this is how this can support you. Like I have to find out someone who wholesales crystals. So we went to my favorite crystal shop up North and was walking around the store and I remember I connected with the, one of the, the uh, people that worked there and I was chatting and she was also a yoga teacher and I said, yeah, you know, I've got, everything's kind of lining up, but I really need to find um, someone who wholesales crystals. And she just looked at me and said, well, we do that. Oh. Like, no way. Like I had no idea. And she said, well, yeah, we'll just, we can get you set up with an account. And I said, well, can I do it today? I have my mask. I have the business license. <laughs> yeah, you're <laughs> yesterday. I'm official. <laughs> I know. I'm like one thing after the other. Like it just was so serendipitous how things came together. I also wanted to point out that you also you were into Reiki and energy healing early, like even before university, right? Yeah, when I was when I was like uh, around. 1920. So it would have been, I started getting a little bit interested in it, but um, my mother and my brother were also both very in tune and um, they're clairvoyant. They would see spirits and, and so forth. And we didn't really talk about it, I guess, until like we were in our teens, but my brother would, I guess, talk to my mom a lot because um, he would see things as a, as a child. And where oh, I'm more, wow. cla I'm more clear sentient and clear audience. So like I feel and I hear, um, mm -hmm. but they see things. And so we decided to take, we found this woman in Hamilton actually, and we decided to take this um, tarot training or some tarot studies. And then we did past life regression and I can't remember some other metaphysical 
That's fascinating. So we started, yeah, I started that early on. And then maybe a couple of years later, um, because working with a beta, it was just so, such an eye-opening experience into the world of Ayurveda. I started studying Ayurveda. We would do a lot of Ayurvedic treatments in the spa. And, um, and then I got my energy healing training going as well, which I would kind of incorporate and, and then the met- metaphysical stuff. And so, you know, like a lot of woo-woo <laughs> sort of things that, you know, in the nineties were very much considered woo-woo and, you know, there's a lot more awareness and acceptance around things now, but, um, but yeah, at the time it was like, Oh, I'm, you know, diving into all of these great, interesting things. Yeah, and now it's it seems something that is, I guess, more tangible because there's an audience for it and there's more acceptance for it. Absolutely, yeah. It's it's a uh, it, well, a lot has changed. Yeah, in the, the, you know, twenty years. So you got your crystals all set up as well. Yeah. So um, yeah. So the crystals, and then um, you know, I just introduced sound therapy. Um, I don't know. I mean, there's just so many, so many different pieces that will come in. And then it's funny, like as soon as I'll say, oh, this is something else that I want to do, then all of a sudden I meet somebody who does that. Or I meet someone who's like, here, let me give you the gift of this book or this knowledge or whatever. Yeah, Um, literally manifesting or keeping an eye open for what you want. mm -hmm, Absolutely. Well, and I mean, the old, you know, um, intent where intention goes energy flows so if we put it our intention out there and that's what we we wish for and we think about and we um you know bring it to life basically yeah i totally agree but i also have some questions because i can imagine i know people who are more like well i want this and it's not happening and for me it's it's hard to explain because it's something that i'm still learning about you know trusting the universe trusting in my intention and also realizing when i'm blocking or sabotaging it do you have experience or do you have a little bit of knowledge around that well i think um you know and i think it's great how you share that because you know sometimes we'll find we keep bumping up against the same thing like why isn't this happening why isn't this happening and you know, often it's, we're not listening, we're not hearing or noticing the subtle signs around, um, you know, like, um, I'll sh- like to, just to share an example, um, probably for six months before my ex and I separated, every morning just before I would wake up, I would have the exact same voice come in and say, you got to get out of this, got to get out of this over and over. And the feeling in like the pit of my stomach, like I, I like, I can't like, you know, I don't, I don't want for this to be, you know, to, to make this change. Um, But sometimes it's about honoring that and then understanding it has to take you somewhere else. And when we're not listening to those things, the universe or, you know, whatever is driving this will end up, sometimes it'll be like a little bump, like tap you on the shoulder, hey, time to move along, or this isn't working for you, or, you know, notice that you're bumping up against this thing. And then sometimes when we don't listen, then it has to become a harder lesson or, a little bit firmer tap. Um, you know, I remember when I was taking my teacher training and it was, I was, ju- I was just like, go, 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 go. And sometimes, you know, we don't listen to our body saying, this is too much right now. You need to slow down. And of course, I don't even know how it happened. I was coming down to let, I had a new puppy. I was coming to let her out at like six <laughs> in the morning missed a step, fell, sprained my ankle horribly. I'm like, well, there you go. Now, now you have to slow down. Now you have no choice. Um, so, you know, I, I, cause I remember thinking like, I should probably take it easy here and not quite, but my, not push myself quite so hard, but I wasn't, I kept going. 
Yeah. Oh, you reminded me of, a, <laughs> um, I was with a trainer a couple of years ago and we were exchanging services and he was trying to get me to do deadlifts. And yeah, I've never, I don't work with weights. I like to work with my body weight. And I remember like a session before I was thinking, whoa, this guy really pushes himself really hard. I'm like, that's, he's always injured. And that thought was in me. And then the next session, he tried to get me to do something. I wasn't sure about it, but I, I'm like, okay, let's try it. And I, I dropped the weight because I felt like my back was being like, you know how you kind of like pull out a lobster tail, like, duck, duck, duck. Oh, wow. And then I fell on the floor and I'm like, oh, and it turns out I dislocated my, I, I had a disc bulge. It wasn't dislocated, but it was like bulge out. And I was just in oh, so oh. much pain. And then my voice from a couple of weeks back was like, yeah, you know how you thought he was pushing himself too hard and it's not good. Well, you let him push you because I, I didn't, I think I didn't react earlier. Right. Yeah. yeah. I, um, yeah, it's, you know, it's like that kind of takes me to thinking about, you know, honoring yourself, living your truth, like knowing what resonates inside of you and like, this resonates. This is, this is what I want to be doing. And then things that don't resonate. Um, you know, and when I say resonate, I, I mean, like, we are all energy. Um, I'm often because I, I, I work with energy. And, um, and again, it's not something that's tangible, where you can say, well, this here, let me, let me show you this energy. Um, <laughs> so it's, you know, it's quantum physics. Uh, my background was science. Like I really love to be able to speak to things from that place as well. But, you know, we know everything is vibrating, all, all matter moves and, um, and just at different frequencies and we're able to measure those frequencies. And so, you know, things will move in at different um, speeds. And that's what I mean, resonate. Like if something is resonate or vibrating, that's more the term that we're used to, right? High vibration, low vibration different vi good vibrations like <laughs> all of that um so yeah if things resonate and they feel right then often it's something that's aligned mm -hmm. and what are some of the practices that can help you be more sensitive or more aware of what aligns with you i would say um well again for me the my my pathway in is my breath so slowing down really deepening my breath you know super long exhales um i feel like it brings me in really quickly and i feel grounded and centered and i mean and i'm connected and that that's the place from where which i can then make bigger decisions and understand if something is aligned or not yeah Imagine if everyone operated that way. <laughs> could be, that's what mindfulness is, basically. Right? Imagine if they taught that in school. <laughs> yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. I, I keep thinking back at the education system. For me, school was very challenging and boring, and I felt like I wasn't really built up for whatever school was trying to prepare me for. But now that I'm out of that environment, I realize I had so much potential that was never being even recognized because I couldn't fit in a box. Yeah, I think, um, I think that there's a lot less, um, I remember when I was working, uh, doing the training and development for Veda and I was starting to get into accelerated learning and looking at all the different learning styles and, you know, having things be tactile and audio and visual, like all of the different learning styles and how, um, you know, traditional education just doesn't embody all of those things. And, Imagine if we taught kids how to be, you know, or, or recognize somatically how things felt in their body, even, you know, not only just in the learning style, but like, where are you feeling that? And um, from an emotional intelligence perspective, how great yeah. that would be to start, you know, preparing at an age. <laughs> <laughs> agree it's something I'm learning recently how does it feel in my body because again so used to being in my mind and rationalizing whatever I'm feeling even rationalize my sadness away my anger like you don't have to be angry that person is just hurt and dismissing my feelings so yeah definitely let's put a curriculum together <laughs> for sure
<laughs> so after your yoga training and incorporating the crystals, how did your life start to shift? Um, well, as I, like, as I mentioned, the, you know, things would kind of start to fall into place. Um, but I, but I also felt, so coaching was something that I used to do when I worked at Aveda and, um, I found that because of this kind of business, you know, working, working so closely and intimately, intimately with people, you end up kind of providing a bit of coaching. And I'm also mm -hmm. an executive, um, leadership coach. So it's like you, know, you were being prepared for this role. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in a way. And you know, but not taking again the traditional approach. Um, I work more. I'm an intuitive coach, and so my role is to work with you to develop your intuition, so that as we're working through traditional coaching kind of objectives that you might have, it's how can you connect to yourself and strengthen that, so then you're able to work and do that for yourself, um, and move from that place of alignment and authenticity and like speaking and living your truth um so that i say that was something else that kind of just naturally grew and developed within my business um yeah i just i don't know um i'm so passionate about training and learning like i will be a lifelong learner um on my whiteboard i always have a list of like oh and then next i'm going to study this and next i'm going to study that <laughs> That's so um, cool. Yeah, what is next I, on the list? Do you have something that is next on the list? Well, so um, when I did my yoga teacher training, I right after I did my yin training, and then I have my yoga nidra. I'm like, now I definitely want to um, do kundalini. Like I, mm -hmm. I enjoyed kundalini practice, and I used to do that actually more in my in my twenties. But now I'm like, I'd like to get into that a little bit more because I work a lot with the chakras and the energy, and it just makes sense. But mm -hmm. yeah, that's one thing that's next. <laughs> That's fun. <laughs> oh, I remember there was also a story that you shared with me that you you quit your job, I think when you were around maybe 23, right after university, and you decided to try out acupuncture. Yes. So another um another lesson of like listening and taking a leap. Uh I yeah, I was 23. I had been working in the spa business and I was a national trainer for Aveda and you know my career was really starting to flourish and I was um I was feeling really great about things and then a client of mine who I'd known for years before um went and did her acupuncture training and I think she was an athletic therapist I can't remember for sure um but when she did the training one of the professors who was her then boyfriend had decided that they were going to set up like an intense program within the program at the university. And it was really designed for Western physicians and, and, or like working in chiropractic, physiotherapy, that sort of thing. And because I had um, a fairly strong, um, you know, anatomy and physiology background, she was like, we can, we can just like sneak you into this <laughs> program. <laughs> <laughs> because it was his um, program as well. And so, but the catch was I had to leave in six weeks and I was going for the fall and, and I just knew I had to go. And I remember saying to my, um, my boss at the time, like, I, I really don't know how else to explain this, but I have to go. And you know, they were like, well, you know, we can't guarantee your job and you have all of these things that, um, you know, you're going to be missing out on. And I just remember saying like, I'm so sorry, but I have to go. Like, I can't, I can't, like, I just have to, anyhow. Um, and then my parents, like, I'm going to go to Sri Lanka and it's still in, in civil war is still happening. Oh my gosh. Um, like I remember when I arrived and the first day going down to the beach and we were sitting there with a couple of our other, like a couple of the other classmates, cause it was an intense group. I think there were five of us. And um, so we would literally from seven in the morning till 11 at night, nonstop would be working. 
and mm-hmm. studying and stuff. Anyway, we were on the beach and I remember looking up and all of a sudden warplanes started circling. And one of the girls had, uh, she was from Germany and she had arrived a few days earlier and they were censoring the news and her parents had sent a fax saying that um, I guess the Tamil and the Sinhalese were arguing over somebody had set up a tourist business in the wrong area and so they said well we're going to bomb the tourist Mm -hmm. area and so I was in Mount Lavinia which is just outside of Colombo so it's a touristy area I'm like, well, here we are. Do I get back on a plane and go home? Like, I've literally just arrived. Yeah. <laughs> um, so it was it was intense, but um, I stayed. And you stayed. How did, <laughs> I guess, learning to recognize the signs, how did you take that not as a sign from the universe telling you that you need to so, leave? Yeah. Um, to be totally honest, I think I was just, I didn't know what to do. Uh, so I don't know whether it was right, right or wrong. Um, the experience still happened. I think, um, yeah, so that, that I don't even know, um, now, but I do know that it was such a poignant time in my life to, I mean, oh my goodness, the huge culture shock to have that experience and see, you know, the incredible wealth and the incredible, lack of wealth like how far apart that was and Mm -hmm. um you know just to have that I mean I hadn't really traveled to a third world country at that point and um you know even working we would have to work in the hospitals in the morning and at night and in the morning we worked in a hospital that was free and so it would be uh, you know a lot of the poor communities and I remember we'd see a lot of kids that had spina bifida and I would have, there would be families that all four or five of them would ride on one bike for like four hours to get there so that they would be able to get treatment for free. And, um, you know, so experiencing that and then at night we would work in a different, a different space um, for a hospital and I would be, you know, treating famous cricket players from, oh. from the country, you know, and their families and, um, and all of that. So it was just, it was really interesting. I remember going out um, it, and to go into this bar, it was a $5,000 U.S. entry fee. Entry and, fee? Entry fee. Like, and that was the, <laughs> it's just like, I, I, how is this? I'm like, where am I? Yeah. Um, so, you know, and it was of the time and, and I'm not sure I haven't been back, but um, it was really quite interesting. So it shaped a lot of uh, the ways that I viewed the world. It, you know, it changed my understanding of people having and have not like, uh, and, um, and I'd say a real uh, eye-opening experience to what it means, like what family means, and how committed these parents were to the treatment for their kids and the lengths they would go to to, you know, to care for them. And there was a lot of beautiful um, experiences that I witnessed. How long were you there for? There as well. I was just there for the fall, so oh. it wasn't that long. Um, but but it was intense. Yeah, I was going to say it was like an intensive experience, literally being exposed to a new world and the contrasts literally night and day, the difference. And then I was, um, I was actually very fortunate because at the end of the trip, the World Health Organization had their big conference or summit um, there. And so the last three days I got to participate in that. And just seeing so many because being on the other side of the world and you know eastern medicine and how they look at things and the studies they would do and it was incredible to be opened up to to that kind of world um so yeah overall i mean it was quite an experience and i was very fortunate that when i got home um they welcomed me back to my job (laughs) (laughs) 
yeah that was that was very very good um but you know taking a leap and doing something that you you don't know but what will come out on the other side yeah. and knowing that it was a kind of chaotic there but even <laughs> within that learning how to thrive that's so touching yeah yeah it really it really was uh it was, a, it was a, a lot of growth happening in a short period of time. Yeah. <laughs> oh, gosh. So what do you do now in addition to um, the current services that you provide? Um, well, I'm working, I'm developing. So this year, obviously, <laughs> has created, um, I say it has like not so gently nudged me in a direction that, um, you know, I had fear around doing videos. Um, I, I had to quickly pivot and took all of my yoga classes online. Um, as everybody who is in the yoga world had to as well. Um, so I started teaching online and I offered that as well. And, um, you know, kind of deepening and exploring um, more distance work with energy healing, um, I do still see people in person as well, but have developed that a little bit more. And then I've, um, something that I've been wanting to do that, again, it's just like, okay, well, I'll just set that aside. And obviously now everything needs to go online. And so I've been developing online um, group programs, which is something I love facilitating. I love, like, that was part of my favorite thing when I used to, um, teach and you know train trainers and all of that it's like I love facilitating and so bringing together a group and helping to facilitate um, the learning process through that really brings me joy and um, and also being able to connect with a number of people um, and without it being just in your you know physical area of where you live so being able to reach a greater market um, yeah, so I've been developing um, a series called uh, Soul Series, basically, um, and I launched the first one in November, which was wonderful. It was called Soul Soothing, and so it was designed um, with self-care strategies to help to restore calm, and so I work now primarily with um, sleep-deprived, anxious, high-functioning women who really need their nervous system soothed and calmed and um, helping them to rebuild inner peace and their energy levels. Mm -hmm. So I've been working on that. And then I'll be running that program again, actually, uh, starting January 15th, mm -hmm. which I'm quite excited about. And I'll be expanding on that. The next program is going to be called Soul Alignment. And we'll be looking at the chakra system and really deepening um, into all of that and then uh, my coaching programs I'm growing those and developing those as well so mm, exciting yeah. I know a lot of um, people I can send your way <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah as long as they're willing to you know how sometimes people want things but they're not ready for it so I'll mm -hmm. wait for the sign <laughs> yes <laughs> and I think that you know to your point that's a really great point um, there's a lot of fear that can come with this, um, it was interesting. I was just writing a blog post um, for a friend's company this week and uh, was talking about meditation and how, you know, being still and being quiet is sometimes such a fearful thing because it just, the things bubble up. You know, it, it's like um, when you get into a deep hip stretch in yoga, it's like, why is everybody crying in class? And, <laughs> you know, when you, when you, when you slow down and when you get into that state, that's when stuff will come up. But it's about shifting from fear around that to really embracing that you are processing. So, um, you know, it's not like, oh my gosh, that made me cry. I don't want to do it anymore. It's like that opened me up. That allowed for me to process this emotion or this feeling or this fear or whatever. And now you can move on and release things. Um, so sometimes it's just shifting the way that you're looking at it. Because 
to your point, a lot of people will be like, yeah, well, when I'm ready and, you know, yeah. and also baby steps, right? That's true. That's can take true. things, take things one at a time. And, um, you know, if, if anybody is interested in that sort of thing as well, I offer a pathway to peace um, strategy session, which is like, it's a complimentary consultation call and figuring out like, what would be the steps? What would the path look like if I was to, you know, embark on, on something like that? Um, yeah. You know, just getting real and honest with yourself about what it is you're looking to make change around and then figuring out how that could possibly happen. Yeah. And it, it helps so much to have someone walk with you, hold that space for you because otherwise you can go anywhere, right? When you sit by yourself with your thoughts and you're not used to it, it can take you to a very overwhelming situation, but having someone like you hold that space and okay, baby steps. If this is what you want to do today, we can work on that. It's super, super helpful. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, it's my honor to be able to hold space for people to move through um, self-exploration, healing, whatever it is um, that's happening. It's, it's like soul filling for me. Yeah, I can see the joy coming out of you, like the energy, even like the lights around you flickered a little bit when you talked about what you were really, really passionate about. I'm like, whoa, energy, I can see it. It's tangible. <laughs> and you also bring up a very interesting point, how sometimes part of that healing, it's scary and it's okay. Yeah. Oh, no, it's, um, I think, you know, there are, there are things that, um, you know, I'm trying to remember the exact quote, but it's like, what you want is on the other side of fear. Or, um, you know, when things make you uncomfortable, that's when you grow the most. And, um, and I think that, you know, like I said, celebrating the fact that you are trying something or that you're putting yourself in an uncomfortable or um, vulnerable situation. I think that is part of the growth. Like, I would never have I had so much fear about coming into this, um, this career path and like making a change because I was a single mom. I was, I had two kids. I had no spousal support. I was like, okay, this is what I'm going to do. <laughs> and just, you know, to be able to go for that. And, um, you know, so I had a lot, I, I can, I share that because I can relate to that, um, that feeling of fear and being able to understand it and honor it and, um, and then begin to move through it. But knowing that the steps are not just like, Oh, get over it and you'll be fine. A hundred percent. And there's no blueprint for it. I think a lot of people want easy fixes. They want to know the, you know, they're like, Oh, would the coaching work? Will I get my result? Will I be rich? Whatever their goal is and knowing that it doesn't really take you to the direction you might expect it, but it will take you where you need to go. Right. Yeah. And I think, um, I think it's also important that you don't need to know the whole path and the whole, all of the steps quite often they'll unfold. Um, you know, there's a visual that I have. Um, I don't know. I'm sure I've seen it like somewhere online where it's like a misty river and there's stones, like stepping stones. And you can only really see the first like one or two maybe in front of you and you're stepping anyway and you don't know where you're going. And, you know, that's the, that's like what it feels like and stepping into the unknown. Um, you know, how is this going to um, impact me as I start to do this work or where is it going to lead me? Just trusting that all you need to know is the next step, one at a time. The pathway how can itself. You, it's so true. How can you grow that trust in yourself? Are there any practices? Um, well, I think that, as I mentioned for myself, you know, breath work, meditation, um, allowing myself to be quiet and feel into things is um, the way that I notice. But, you know, keen observation of, you know, or, or honing your awareness around things that are happening. So 
as you make certain choices that you felt in your gut and then you're like ah that was that was right um you know i think that with energy work <clears throat> excuse me i i uh tune in and and have a lot of message that, messages that will come through and i'm very much a channel for um for those messages and for spirit sending stuff through and you know as you start that sort of thing and i share this as an example but as you start um doing that sort of thing you're like what what, what? i can't say that like you know to somebody that i don't even know or to share it's like figuring out how to do it and then when you honor that process and and you share something and then it reaffirms like okay that is i am hearing the right message you know you deliver it you get confirmation um so taking that kind of a story and applying it to yourself if you feel something in your gut if you hear something that's like needling in your subconscious or going listen to me and then you listen and then you have this result and you recognize it and celebrate it that will only strengthen your connection and your ability to continue yes. that makes sense with the whole long yeah. whole con long convoluted story <laughs> No, but it's so helpful because I know so many people in my life that are like, this is not happening for me. Times are tough and I can feel that energy where they're closing themselves. And I get it because I've been there. So I'm like, what are ways that can like gently help them open up a little bit more? And they have to be willing. I think that's the most mm -hmm. important part. You can take the step for them. So this like example is perfect and hopefully anybody listening it can kind of nudge them towards okay maybe I should listen to myself yeah it's not always like this is what I want and oh I didn't get that result it's like the little the little subtle shifts that happen things don't always happen big and quickly so acknowledging all those little things um yeah. can also feel less scary and like builds the connection yes oh. I want to close this up with some rapid fire questions. All right. <laughs> What's the best compliment you've ever received? Oh, the best compliment. Um, I think um, just again, going back to like making that connection and sharing and just like in the words of my client, like, holy cow, lady. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. <laughs> I can't share the story, but like that was like, oh, I got it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, I could feel that energy almost like, yes. <laughs> A book that's changed your life. Um, the Alchemist. Um, Paulo Coelho, uh, mm -hmm. Coelho. And um, yeah, the you know, story of Santiago and that was absolutely um and again I read that in my early twenties and just the whole the whole story it was like the book was gifted to me by a then not really a boyfriend boyfriend sort of thing <laughs> and um that was a serendipitous meeting and then reading that book and have, have you read that yeah paulo coelho is one of my favorite authors oh, yeah. I, I love his writings yeah likewise oh. yeah what does coming home to yourself mean um it really means to be able to live authentically, um, you know, speak my truth, live my truth, um, and not hiding under a facade of what I think I'm expected to be, if that makes sense. Um, I don't know, and being able to just like feel into things. So powerful. <laughs> <laughs> what would you like more of? Um, right now, hugs. Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, you don't realize how much you need them. <laughs> <laughs> and aside from that, like travel and learning and training and like all that stuff. Yeah. yeah. But first, hugs. Yeah. Oh. Any <laughs> advice for younger self? Um, just like trust that gut feeling. Yeah. yeah really trust and listen. Um, the earlier that it can be developed, the better. I am it's part of our, you know, dinner time conversation with the kids. I was about to ask you, is it something Absolutely. that they're open to? Um, it's funny, like they both, 
you know, they've got some crystals in their room and my son is a little, wasn't used to be a little bit more into it. He's very, they're both empaths, but in a different way. And um, he picks up on stuff um, spiritually, I think a little bit more. And my daughter is very connected emotionally. And, um, but it's funny because there's a lot of resistance around it, which is totally fine. And I always come at it from like, it's okay. You make your own decisions in life, what you believe in, what you want to do. Um, but as they, I just really encourage, like, if you're feeling something, process that, lean into it, try to understand it, um, you know, so that they're able to connect with those feelings. And I think it's interesting, just quickly on this, like, as adults, we so, we, you know, we want to, like, kind of, like, skim over that stuff to just make things okay. Or, um, you know, my daughter picks up on feelings like, why am I so sad? And it's like, oh, well, my boyfriend and I are having really hard conversations that day and there's a lot of sadness. It's like letting her know there's sa- you're feeling that sadness. That's why you're not going crazy. <laughs> because she's like, I don't know why I'm sad. I'm just crying. Um, yeah. You know, but allowing those connections to happen earlier. And, um, and again, I feel like it's setting them up for emotional intelligence, like a strong yeah. emotional intelligence amazing finally where can people find you um well becoming still.ca is probably the easiest way um all my offerings are on there there's an opportunity to um again book a complimentary session so we can chat uh it would be my honor to chat with you and um yeah and then and my email and everything else is on there so that's probably the best spot Oh, amazing. I'll also link it in the show notes with everything so that people can find it easier. Well, thank you, Jessica. Thank you for so much for joining me today. Oh, thank you so much for having me. It was such a pleasure. I'll talk to you very, very soon. Okay. (laughs) Thank you so much for listening to the Whole and Unleashed podcast. What was your takeaway from today's conversation? Let me know in the comments or review. I would love to hear from you. Subscribe to get new episodes each week and visit wholeandunleashed.com slash podcasts for more information.